The gentleman from Massachusetts, Mr. Lynch, is recognized. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, I'd like to thank all the witnesses. Thank you for your service. Uh, I would actually not want to know about Hunter Biden's laptop. I'd like to know about the attacks on, on January 6th, if we could. And uh, Lieutenant Pyatt and General Flynn, uh, again, thank you for appearing today. Uh, Lieutenant Pyatt, in your written testimony, you stated that, quote, it was important for the D.C. National Guard to figure out the basics of their new mission. But Major General William Walker has testified that, that his forces were ready to go well before he finally received Acting Secretary Miller's authorization to deploy to the Capitol. Lieutenant General Pyatt and General Flynn, our committee has obtained evidence that you both recommended that the National Guard deploy to protect other federal buildings, other federal buildings and locations in Washington, D.C. to help relieve civilian police and security forces so they could go and defend the Capitol. Is that correct? Congressman, we received the, re the first request on one, 1 January, and we spent those days preparing the D.C. National Guard to support Mayor Bowser's request for unarmed traffic control points and crowd control. When the call came in, and it was after 14 or 2.22 that afternoon, the urgent request now was to support the Capitol. That was the change of mission. The whoa, approval whoa, to whoa, support... Whoa, 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 let me, let me just back, let me claim my time. On January 4th, 2021, at the direction of then Sergeant Ob's Michael Stenger and then U.S. Capitol Police Chief Stun, they contacted General Walker to find out how many National Guard he could provide and how fast could he provide them if they were needed at the Capitol on January 6th. So we're, we're talking about an urgent need for the National Guard, D.C. National Guard, on the Capitol, not, not other buildings. And so I go, I go back uh, to the apparent decision by yourself and, and General Flynn to deploy National Guard not to the Capitol, but to other federal buildings around D.C. And, and other monuments. Is that is that what happened here? Congressman, on the 3rd and 4th, both the Department of Defense and the Department of the Army asked Capitol Police if they needed additional support, and both times the answer we were told they were not. What happened at the urgent request for now forces to come to the Capitol is we knew we would have to remission them because they did not have their riot control gear with them. We had to get them back to the armory. We had to reconfigure them and re-equip them to get them forward. Okay. On the phone call, what I suggested was is we were looking at a range of options. Is there anything we could do immediately in the current posture we would in that would then help relieve others to get to the Capitol? There, were, there was not, and we but, moved on from all that. All right, so let's go to January 6th. This is... January 6th at 420, Lieutenant Pyatt, you reportedly told Major General Walker that the National Guard should, quote, plan and prepare to transition from traffic control points and be placed around other federal buildings and monuments. This is when it was hitting the fan at, at the Capitol, at, 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 at D.C., you know, at, at the Capitol complex. The, the Capitol was at, say, uh, under attack. And you were deploying or recommending that Walker employ, General Walker uh, deploy people to, to other, other buildings. And I just, I can't reconcile that, given the threat that, that we were under. And, and I'm, I'm, I'm just curious, at that moment, what, what were you thinking? Uh, what, were, what, was your, what was your reasoning? Congressman, I'm sorry, Congressman. Go ahead. Congressman. I, I do not know where that report came from. I, I denied that. At, at 4.30 that afternoon, we were minutes away from getting an approved plan from Sec Secretary McCarthy. We had approval at 3 o'clock to use the Guard. We had At 3.04, we had approval for full mobilization of the D.C. National Guard. What we needed was a new mission, and that new mission is what took time. There was no other seeking approval. But, we needed but, to redeploy look, forces look, look, and look, let me just, them. on the chronology, uh, your, your, your recollection does not match what the record says. So the, the, the 420 call was 80 minutes after Secretary Miller determined that all available forces of the D.C. National Guard 
are required to reinforce D.C. police and U.S. Capitol Police positions. So it, it almost seems like we're deploying the National Guard or recommending their deployment away from the Capitol. And I, I just, I haven't got a good answer on that, and I'm not getting one today. Congressman, I, I would recommend, I would refer to the U.S. Army Report of Operations on 6 January <laughs> that we submitted to this committee. The timeline was that we had approval at 3 o'clock after the 2.30 phone call. We had approval to mobilize at, at 3.04. Then we needed to have a plan which required the redeployment of the Guard, reconfiguration, re-equipment, now to go into a mission that they were not previously conducting. They were conducting an unarmed traffic control point. That was the time we needed, and we recalled people from their civilian workforce. What the D.C. National Guard did in those short hours was extraordinary. Now, when people's lives are on the line, two, two minutes is too long, but we were not positioned to respond to that urgent request. We had to re-prepare so we would send them in prepared for this now, this new mission. Madam Chair, my time has expired. Thank you, General. I uh, yield back the balance of my time. The gentleman yields back. In the FBI's view, the top domestic violent extremist threat comes from racially or ethnically motivated violent extremists, specifically those who advocated for the superiority of the white race. That is an absolute flat out lie. It is not our greatest threat. Not once in his speech today did Merrick Garland mention last summer's BLM riots or skyrocketing crime on our streets, the riots we still see week in and week out. How about Merrick Garland? You condemn this man on your screen, Justin Tyran Roberts, arrested for shooting five people in a 20-hour shooting spree in Georgia over the weekend. You know why he did it, according to investigators? They insist he was intentionally targeting white, military-looking men. That sounds racially motivated to me. He didn't mention that. No mention of this black-on-white crime because it doesn't fit their divisive narrative. These are stories that are actually happening in America. How about we stop issuing fake warnings about crime based off of political agendas and start prosecuting all criminals, no matter what color they are? When you're up there, are you just getting tired of being told you're a racist, I'm a racist, everybody watching is a racist? Yeah. They have to talk about January 6th, and they have to talk about things that divide us on, uh, along racial grounds. It is, it is so wrong, but that's who the Democrats are today. They're this radical left-wing party, and they have nothing else positive to talk about, so they have to go here. Yeah. You know, you look at January 6th. Everybody has said it was a tragic day. It never should have yep. happened. They wanted people that were violent and destructive put away. But, you know, I was looking at Senator Ron Johnson. He looked at hours and hours and hours of tapes, and he was like something like 40% of the people were just let in by Capitol Police. But they don't talk about any of that. And you have SWAT teams showing up in California at somebody's house trying to rouse them out of the house for walking around taking selfies inside that Capitol. It isn't right, Congressman. Or how about the couple in Alaska who weren't even in the Capitol? I mean, look, you're right. We Republicans have been, conservatives have been consistent. We condemned the violence that took place on January 6th, and we condemned all of it that took place all last summer with all these, uh, in all these metropolitan areas around our, around our great country. The Democrats are the ones who have been hip hypocrites on this. They did, they, last summer was fine. That was a righteous cause. But then they focused on, on January 6th. But the couple in Alaska who weren't even in the Capitol, the FBI kicks in their door, holds them at gunpoint, handcuffs them, interrogates them for four hours. They got the wrong couple. And then they take their phones, their laptop, and their pocket-sized copy of the Constitution. Talk about, I mean, th that, there's got to be irony in that, that, that fact alone. So, yeah, th where's the consistency that we would like from everyone? We've been consistent. I wish the Democrats would do the same. Yeah. Well, there's my pocket constitution. I carry it with me all over the place. <laughs> and I'm in Texas, Congressman. Come and take it. Usually we're talking about guns. This time I'm talking about my constitution. In the FBI's view, the top domestic violent extremist threat comes from racially or ethnically motivated violent extremists, specifically those who advocated for the superiority of the white race. Garland did not provide any numbers or statistics to back up this claim, but pointed to past racially motivated shootings and attacks, as well as the January 6th riot on Capitol Hill. 
Noticeably, Garland spent his entire 26-minute speech without even mentioning the summer of riots one time, simply ignoring months of attacks on police and federal buildings in cities all across this country as if it just didn't happen. Steve, I think this shows how politicized Biden's DOJ has really become ignoring vi radical violent groups like Antifa, like BLM, simply because they support the left-wing agenda. Yeah, unfortunately, it's another example of two sets of rules or two sets of narratives, really, in a way. And the narrative being spread here, of course, is that that January 6th is, uh, was a, a riot that somehow endangered the American Republic, which is not in any sense true. It was an unarmed riot, inexcusable for to be sure, but unarmed. No, not one person has been charged with having a firearm inside the Capitol that day, and it lasted a few hours. To try to compare that to weeks of rage and carnage across the summer last year in 2020 um, is just totally ludicrous and illogical. Unfortunately, that's right where Merrick Garland went. They're essentially pitting Americans against one another by labeling it via basically a race war, which is essentially what they're implying with that statement. I don't agree with it. And I think it's absolutely horrifying to see that you have the DOG, DOJ essentially being weaponized against the American people. There was, a, there was a rally in Chicago of white supremacists on January 25th, and they put out a national call and they got 80 people to show up in Chicago. And according to one expert, five people were from the Chicago area. Out of about, what, eight or nine million people who live in Chicago, there were five people. Right. And so a lot of this uh, the southern, the, relies on the Southern Poverty Law Center and the statistics that they put out and the media regurgitate that. And so I think we have to be careful. Certainly, I, I do not trust the media uh, on this issue because they, they have proven themselves to be, uh, you know, not reliable when it comes to being partisan and pushing certain narratives. So um, is white supremacy, it, is there some in the United States? Absolutely. Is it the most uh, biggest threat to, to America? I think that's overblown, and I think that the administration is pushing it for their own political reasons. You know, it seems to me that race relations in America in recent decades have improved so dramatically that things like, for example, interracial marriages are totally unremarkable in America today. Uh, and it is not considered acceptable in polite society at all to have racist views. And yet we have people like Garland and Joe Biden who want to insist that the country is systemically racist. Are they essentially protesting a struggle that has already been won in American culture? You know, there has been tremendous progress in this country. And, and for a lot of folks uh, on the left to, to, as they're saying now, this is, you know, voting rights, it's Jim Crow 2.0, that there's been no progress made since the 1960s or even the 1860s. I mean, that, most Americans understand that's ludicrous. I mean, that is gaslighting, right? That is an absolute gaslighting right. of the American people. And so I think, uh, again, in our normal everyday lives, we do not see the bogeymen that are being made out. There are not Klansmen walking around the corner. There are not white supremacists uh, gathering on street corners. And so I think, uh, you know, that ultimately falls flat to the American people because that's not what we see and we live in our day-to-day -day lives. Right. And we understand that racism is really, uh, you know, has, has been a thing of the past. I mean, does it still exist today? Sure it does in certain areas. But is the, is the country systemically racist and oppressive? I don't think most people believe that.